We want to pray for all of those teenagers and young people that are going to foundations this week. We're glad that they uh, are getting to go. and No doubt will be a very rich week for them and edifying. And But we do pray uh, for their safety. Pray for all of those that are sick. Hope you'll come back tonight. Our young people will be conducting the services, but I'll do a, be doing an expository lesson on Matthew chapter 14, and that is Peter walking on the water. So if you would, come back tonight, and if you're not in a habit of worshiping on Sunday night, come back, make it a habit. Start today by worshiping with us. Let's go to Luke chapter 14. We're going to uh, look at Luke 14, or... Luke 4, I'm sorry, Luke 4, 16 through 21. This is a quotation of what Caleb just read for us. Caleb read from Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2, which is uh, written in the 8th century or by the 8th century prophet Isaiah concerning uh, the Lord. Now listen to verse 16. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up as his custom was. He went into the synagogue of the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. I want to pause just a moment. The first and only time in Scripture that it says Jesus read. Verse 17, And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, And when he opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is appointed, uh, is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and to recovering of sight, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book. And he gave it again to the attendant or to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is the Scripture fulfilled fulfilled in your ears. The Bible tells us that our Lord went into the synagogue as would be His custom. And the Bible says that He went to a certain passage. It wasn't by chance. He went to the passage that prophesied about Him. Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. And the Bible says that he read from that passage. And then it says, and he closed the book. If you know what the word book there means, it literally is the word biblion. Biblion means, can be defined as a book or a scroll. No doubt it would probably be a scroll. I am told uh, that when they would take the book of Isaiah and unroll it, that it could be as long as 60 to 65 feet in length. Don't know. That's what uh, Josephus and some other uh, historians say. Now, could you imagine this? Jesus is reading uh, from Isaiah. Not by chance, because He is teaching them a lesson. Now let me point out something else to you. In the earlier part of this chapter, he had been led up into the temple, up into the mountain there to pray or to be tempted by the Lord, uh, to be tempted by the devil. And the scripture says there that after those three temptations that he left Jerusalem and he came unto Nazareth. He came to his homeland. Someone said uh, that he came unto Nazareth because of those hair-splitting Jewish leaders in Jerusalem uh, would really have a serious problem with he saying that he was the fulfillment of that Scripture. And they did later on. And he had to deal with that. But notice the text says uh, that as he is in Nazareth, 
the Bible says in verse 16, that he stood in the synagogue. He went into the synagogue. And uh, one translation says that he came to read. He came to the synagogue as was his custom. Every Saturday, the Sabbath day, they would come together to worship. Someone said that the attendant could be and perhaps would have been uh, Jairus. I preached on him last week. We don't know that. But it could have been because he was working in the temple. But it, to me, what is really interesting about this passage is when the Bible says, and he closed the book. He closed the book. That's what I want to talk about today. I want to look at some things that has happened because Jesus closed the book. He closed the book concerning prophecies about Him. Now, if you look at this passage, and I, I never caught this. I believe it was uh, Brother Winkler that pointed this out. He didn't quote Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. He left one thing out. And the one thing they left out was, and the day of vengeance of our God. And no doubt all of those people, especially those scribes, they would have been listening. They would have known exactly what he was saying and what the text had said. Perhaps they were the ones that had been copying the text. And so they're listening to what the Lord said. But what is interesting, when he closed the book, when he rolled the scroll up, be the same concept, what did that really mean later on? Did you know... I said this one time, and a fellow told me that I was wrong. He said there's 297. There are over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament that was fulfilled in the New Testament concerning the Messiah, the Christ. And what's interesting about that, some of even to the minute details in the book of Psalms and in the book of uh, the prophets said about the coming of Messiah and what He would go through in His trials and in His uh, death was fulfilled. Even those minute details. You see, Jesus fulfilled those prophecies concerning Him. That's what the text says in verse 21. This day is a Scripture fulfilled in your ears. Not only that, in John 5 and verse 39 and 40, He says, search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. He says, they are they which testify of Me. But you will not come unto Me that I might give you life. Search the Scriptures that you may know. So when we think about uh, the Jesus closing the book, not literally, but by His death on the cross, He fulfilled those prophecies about the coming of the Messiah. I thought it was very interesting that Dave Miller said one time that you can look at the prophecies concerning the Christ and what you have, it shows you the validity of inspiration. You can look at something that said that would happen six to eight hundred years prior to it happening, and you see it fulfilled in the New Testament, and that shows us the validity that it is authentic, that it is inspired of God. Not only that, what you find when Jesus closed the, the book on the old law, he did away with the law of Moses. In Matthew 5, 17 and 18, you might say, why is this so important? Did you know that a lot of our problems in the religious world is because we have failed to understand which law that we live under today? And Jesus says, Think not that I have come uh, to destroy. One translation, I believe it's a New American Standard, says, I have come to abolish the law. I didn't come to destroy the law and the prophets, but I came to fulfill the law and the prophets. Christ has become of no effect to you. Galatians 5 and verse 4. When you try to go back and be justified under the law of Moses, Christ is not, have, has not become of any effect to you. And you have fallen from grace. 
Galatians 5 and verse 4. Colossians 2 verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, contrary to us, He took it out of the way and He nailed it to the cross. Friends, if we could just understand that the law of Moses was an imperfect law to an imperfect people and that it was given by God to bring them to faith, to get them to understand that there was coming a Messiah and that Messiah would come to save the world from their sins, if we could get the folks to understand that we're not under that law, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, contrary to us, he took it out of the way and he nailed it to the cross. There was a lady one time that said, you, you, you don't understand. She said, uh, the Apostle Paul is the Antichrist. The Antichrist. And she said, you don't understand that most of the New Testament was written by Paul, and so therefore, uh, it's not of God. And then she advocated the idea of living, and by the way, she used to be a member of the Lord's Church, and uh, now she believes that everything that we live by today is Jewish. The intent in the New Testament is all to the Jewish folks. And she said that what we fail to recognize, and she said, I failed to recognize this for years, is that the law of Moses was a permanent law and that we teach that it was a temporary law. I said, well, it doesn't matter what we teach. I'm just telling you what Scripture says. What Scripture says that Jesus, when He died on the cross, He nailed that law, He nailed that law to the cross. He fulfilled that law. He took it out of the way. Now, if we still have two laws, and that's the way I grew up, believing that all the Bible was from God, and it is, and that everything in the Bible, we have to obey everything in the Bible. So therefore, we've got a problem. Because in the Old Testament, they came together on the Sabbath day. Where is Jesus? He's in the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Why? Because that was what they were commanded to do under the law of Moses. But where do you find them worshiping, the church coming together and worshiping on the Sabbath day once Christ died, fulfilled that law, did away with that law? It is the New Testament. It's the New Covenant. And that New Covenant has been established by Christ. So it's so, so important. Not only that, when it comes to divine revelation, did you know that when Christ died on the cross uh, that He established what we call divine revelation? As a matter of fact, in times past, God, uh, He spoke through, through the prophets, but hath in these last days spoken unto us through His Son. You see, my friends, divine revelation. Do you realize how important the Scripture and the Word of God really is? Do we know and do you understand uh, that when you open up your Bible, that it's God communicating to you, God speaking to you? And that's the reason we talked about even in our Bible class that he that hath ears, let him hear. That doesn't mean that you've just got physical ears. That means that you've got ears that are attentive to the Word of God, that you respect the reverence and you reverence the Holy Word of God, not in the way that you just physically touch it or handle it, but in the way that you read it, you study it, you meditate, and God speaking to you. Now, Jesus closed the book. He closed it on divine revelation. What do you mean by that? When the last book of the Bible was written, we believe the book of Revelation. It's probably about in the 90s, maybe a 96. The pen of inspiration was put down. God no longer, no longer communicated through a man His mind, His will, and told Him to write it down and give it. That revelation has been laid down. Now, does God still work in our lives? Well, sure He does. Romans 8, 28, through His providence, God's working behind the scenes. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about divine revelation Apocalypus, which literally that God is revealing His mind, His will to humanity. God no longer does that. 
There is a problem that I see in the church that some have adopted through the years that is kind of dangerous to me. The world's been adopting a long time. Here is the concept that before you can really understand the Bible, that you have to have the Holy Spirit to lead you and to open up your mind and guide you in order for you to really understand the Bible. Friends, nowhere in Scripture does it say that the Holy Spirit is given in order to help you. Un I've heard people say this, God, be with our speaker today. Guide him, lead him, bring to his remembrance all. How's God going to do that? Let's just suppose this week that I didn't study at all. And you pray that prayer and I get up here and I'm waiting on God to reveal that to me. Is God going to do that? Absolutely not. I just read someone's statement the other day, a Facebook pay, uh, post that says, the Holy Spirit, the reason most of us don't understand the Bible is because we don't pray for the Holy Spirit to reveal it to us and to help us understand it. Now, am I against understanding Scripture? Am I against praying for wisdom? Absolutely not. Of course not. But that is a far cry from believing that God is going to send the Holy Spirit directly upon my mind and guide my mind and help me understand something that I absolutely just haven't studied. That's part of what Revelation does through Scripture. 2 Peter 1 verse 3, As His divine power has given unto us all things that pertain to life and to godliness. Not only that, the Bible says in Galatians 1, I want to read this passage to you because it's in a very, very interesting verse. Listen to what Paul said in the book of Galatians when he says that he uh, certified uh, the gospel of Christ. How did he do that? Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. I want you to turn your Bibles with me, please. Galatians chapter 1, listen to this. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of, Je of Jesus Christ. What did Paul say that he preached to the Galatians? That which I received, that which I received by revelation. Does God still give revelation to man today? Yes, through the Word of God. But the pen of inspiration, divine inspiration, and divine revelation is no longer being revealed today. Now you might say, what's the big deal if he's harping all over that? Let me tell you why. You know how many books that people believe that are inspired? There was a fellow who told me one time, he said, uh, now when you preach, I guess you use Alexander Campbell's book. I don't know if I've ever read Alexander Campbell's book. I had a history class of biblical history. Then we had uh, some other classes, and I think that was part of the reading time. I don't think I read it all. I asked the teacher, was it going to be on the test? And he said, no, not necessarily. That's why I'm not going to read it. And do I appreciate what Campbell, what I've heard that Campbell did? I appreciate a lot what he did. But friends, divine revelation didn't come through Alexander Campbell. Divine revelation came from God to the Apostle Paul to those inspired writers. They wrote it down. You've got it. Once the pen was given, uh, laid down, you no longer have inspiration. So, so, when we preach, we should preach book, chapter, and book. Book, chapter, and verse. Book, chapter, and verse. Every one of them. Is that too much to ask? That's what you're going to be judged by. Not only that. You know God's will when He closed the book? I'm taking that as a statement that, not out of context, but just the concept itself, that when Jesus closed the book of inspiration, He closed His will regarding salvation. There's no other way that God can save man other than what's written right here in this book. I've heard people say, well, you know, they didn't obey the gospel. They didn't really believe in Jesus. But who knows? We, God may save them anyway. 
Well, I'm glad God's the judge of another man's soul. That's not my job. But I sure wouldn't tell a man or tell a family member that that man's going to heaven when that man refused to do what God said to do to be saved. And yet, we hear that quite often. In Hebrews chapter 9, he talks about how in verses 15 through 17, it took the death of the testator. And once the testator was still alive, the will of, was no effect. But once the testator died, that will went into effect. Now what does that mean in common uh, vernacular? What it means is that Christ made a will, and once He died, that will went into effect. So when you read passages like this, this is not a countable doctrine. This is not something that we de decided that we wanted to vote on, and we sent uh, delegates, and we decided that's what we're going to believe. That's what Scripture says. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. Friends, why can't we just understand that? Why do we have to have somebody to tell us what that means? When the will of God was initiated and given and the terms of salvation that was given by Jesus and by those inspired writers, there's no other way to be saved. Accountable person, that is. So, when you read 2 John 9, verses... Uh, 9 through 11, 2 John, it says this. If someone come into you and they do not have the doctrine of Christ, they neither have the Son uh, nor the Father. But if they have the doctrine of Christ, they have both the Son and the Father. And he said, if they do not have the doctrine of Christ, don't bid them into your house. Because, verse 11, you cannot be a bidder of, uh, of the evil deeds or a partaker of another man's evil deeds. Friends, there's all kinds of false teaching in the world today. It is amazing to me at how many people that used to stand firm on the truth, on the Word of God, colleges, Christian universities, some even... Schools of preaching that used to stand firm and teach men uh, from the Bible His will concerning salvation. And it seems as though it's no longer popular. Jesus closed that book, I promise you. Did you know that Jesus closed the book about any difference between Jew and Gentile? You know when you look in the Old Testament... There was a, a real divide. Because what you have in the patriarchal law, which lasted about 2,500 years, from that law, God communicating to the heads of the families, the fathers, the patriarch, and then God took out of those people the Jewish people, and God gave them a particular law for the Jewish people of which the Christ would come through and uh, introduce to those Jewish people that the Messiah would come and through the lineage of David and Abraham, etc. And what you have one day, you have them coming back together, the Jew and the Gentile. Listen to what Paul said in Romans 10 verse 12, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile, for the same Lord that is over the rich is unto all that call Him. There is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. And to one body, Paul says in Ephesians 2.16, for unto this one body, the church, God call the Jew and the Gentile, and there is no difference. You see, brethren, when we come into this assembly... We're not, we don't look at a person and say, well, you're a Jew and I'm a Gentile, and regard one. We're Christians. God in this one body, unlike in the law of Moses when there was a great division, you had to even be a proselyte, a Gentile, to the Jewish religion before they would even be allowed into the outer part of the temple. But now, my friends, there is no difference. In Galatians 3, verse 28... There is neither bond nor free, male or female, Jew or Gentile. We're all one in Christ. That's what Christ did for us. You understand that? When He closed the book and when uh, the pen of inspiration was laid down, you, you, you understand that God has no special people other than Christians. First Peter 2, 9 and 10. 
We are a chosen generation. We are a holy, holy nation. You think about that for a moment. God, they can understand this. Written to, uh, in Peter's day, those people that had been dispersed, those Jews. And now he's saying, hey, as Christians, as newborn babes, as Christians, we're one in Christ Jesus. Not only that, the last one, the Lord taught us, He closed the book that there's not another age after this age. Remember Acts 2.17? In Acts 2, verse 17, he quotes from Joel chapter 2, verse 28, that in these last days, God would pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. And then Peter, in his sermon, he quotes that. And he says, now this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. You see, in Hebrews 1, 1, the Bible says, God who at sundry times and divers manners spoke unto us by the prophets, but hath in these last days spoken unto us through His Son. Do you realize that when this, when time is no more, when this world comes to an end, there's not another age? Now, in the patriarchal law, they may not have understood it, but if you had lived during the time of the patriarchs, there was going to come a time when there would be another dispensation, another period. And that would be the Mosaic. If you had lived in the Mosaic time, at about 1,500 years, and you understood prophecy, you would know that there was going to come a new law. There was going to come a, a, a different era. But you know, you live in the Christian age, and there is no other. The terms of salvation given under the law of Christ. The New Testament. God has no other way to save you. Somebody says, you don't understand how God's going to operate. You don't know. You, 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 may, you may be fooled because God, who created the world, He can do anything He wants to do. Friends, God can't do anything that violates His divine will. If He can and He does, that would be up to Him. But He would be in violation of this will, of this testator, this testament that was given. And He said once the testator dies, Jesus that will went into effect. Can't change it. And the terms of that will would be made known. When you look at Luke chapter 4, I'm looking at it from the viewpoint of what Jesus physically did. And uh, it's kind of interesting because uh, the Lord even talked about how that they were going to uh, reject Him. He said a prophet has not even uh, got honor in his own country. He goes on to say that in that same chapter. And then the work goes from Nazareth and it's eventually going to go into Jerusalem and they reject Him. People of His own reject Him and turn away from Him. But the fact of it is, friends, when you look at the scheme, the scheme of redemption, and you look at God's message to humanity, you open up this Bible, the New Covenant, every person that will read can understand it, if he'll read and uh, really give it ample time, study it, you can know the truth, you can understand the truth, you can obey the truth, and one day you can go to heaven and be with God. That's exactly what God wants you to do. Maybe today, some of the things that I've said, maybe you're waiting on God to send the Holy Spirit directly to you and give you a, a better understanding. You may think you got it, and I'm not saying that people that feel that way, that they are lying about it. I just think they're caught up in emotionalism. Because if He did that to one, He'd have to do it to all. And if God's going to do that, why do we need the divine will? I think we need to pray, as James says in James 1, 5, for wisdom, for understanding. And we do our uh, due diligence in studying and making applications. If you're not a Christian... Would you repent of your sins, confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Would you be baptized to have your sins washed away by the blood of Jesus, added to the beautiful body of Christ? Live. What a blessing it is to live every day in harmony with the will of God by living faithfully and, and serving God faithfully, bringing honor and glory to God. If you need to come back home, would you come? While together we stand as we sing together.